Now, welcome to meeting number 3,768 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Okay, we have two basic rules at the college. The first one is one fool at a time. And the other one is there are no personal attacks. No personal attacks. Now, our format is to have a presentation followed by question and answers. And these should be questions. The third part are we we'll give a few minutes to everybody to make remarks or rebuttals on the topic, if they so wish. And the fourth part is the speakers will be given the final uh, opportunity to speak, and there are no other speakers after them. So they get the final thing, and final means final. Okay, now, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give advertisement for our upcoming programs. On June the 1st, a young man, Tom O'Donnell, is, will, has asked the question, why is life not financially fair? So we'll give an explanation for social stratification in our nation. Why is it? On June the 8th. Hang on. Um, okay, hang on. I got to get that. Sorry about that, Charlie. Go ahead. All right, you got June the 1st. June the 1st is there. Tom O'Donnell. Okay, life is not financially fair. On June the 8th, we'll be getting into ecological topics and the hazards cities pose to migratory bird populations. This is an active group in the city of Chicago, not been to the college before. On June the 15th, our old Sid Cohen will be talking about Marxism and specifically dialectic materialism of Marxism. That's on June the 15th, our own senior speaker at the college. On June the 22nd, the retired academic maintains that capitalism is in fact the cause of climate, the climate crisis. So if we want to stop climate, global warming, we've got to rid ourselves of capitalist profit seekers. That's on the 22nd. On June the 29th, we'll be looking at the plans, the blueprint, the plans of what the Trump and the Republicans plan to do with the United States government, how they plan to change it. They've got a very extensive plan. It goes into hundreds of pages. I think it's 400 some pages long, a detailed plan. They, they don't think that Trump had sufficient opportunity in his first term to accomplish what he wanted to do to change radically changed the government of the United States. Very important program. Transitioning into July, we're going to try something called a point-counterpoint. Used to Julie Charles Paydock will be presenting my list that I've compiled of 25 mistakes that this country has made. I will offer as well 25 solutions. I'll be joined by Peter Pirro, who says he's got 25 things that the United States did correctly. I don't think so. On June the 13th, this is a nationally recognized expert. We're going to look at the topics of geoengineering, weather modification, and chemtrails in particular. So Matt Landman put out two videos, got another video coming out, ascertaining the nefarious plot uh, uh, regarding the spraying of chemicals across our nation. Okay, um, oh see, has anyone got any announcements? I know you're gonna talk about, we lost one of our members, tragically, uh, but Tim, did you wanna talk about? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 all right. Um, one of our members who we uh, 
lost uh, recently was a guy by the name of David Zucker. He used to be a rather active participant in the College of Complexes. As a matter of fact, they used to give him a ride home quite a bit. Now, Dave's uh, funeral is going to be on July 31st at a synagogue in in, in uh, near uh, going to be at a synagogue and I Trying to remember the Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Park. KAM Israel. Yeah, the KAM uh, Israel. Hyde Park Boulevard here in University Valley. Want to come up here and talk to Tal about it, Ernie, because I don't have it in front of me. But anybody well, in attendance is asked to, I'll put in the chat David's brother's is email. The here? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the thing is, is that anybody he wants right. to attend, he's yeah. going to have a luncheon afterwards and he wants to get a good answer account. So if you're planning on attending email, I'm going to put his email in the chat and I'll also get mine down if you want more further information. Um, is there any other announcements from the good of the crowd here tonight or not? All right, come on up and uh, share your announcement. Has everybody been able to hear me with no trouble? Yes. For those living on the north side, the Wugums Parade, uh, which is always on Memorial Day, not on the weekend, and not on Saturday or Sunday, but on the day and on Labor Day. And, um, let's see, that's uh, Wellington Oakdale Old Glory Marching Society. It's kind of a fun little walking parade uh, near Pine Grove and I think Wellington. It's on... Uh, it's on Monday, and I believe it's at 11 o'clock, although you can check that online. Okay, Ellen, you got an announcement? Go ahead. You no, know, the pro-Palestinian, uh, they had a march today uh, down at the water tower. I have a friend, Lee, that had been telling me about it. And I was at one last week. They say that for the Democratic Convention, the Black Lives Matter, I've made friends with the new Black Lives Matter president, and um, we're going to work together on research, but for the getting ready for the Democratic convention to to participate in marching and protesting there. Jake, did you have an announcement? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. my announcement is uh, yeah, yeah. A guy by the name of uh, Barrett Tromo, who was one of the uh, founders of Vietnam Vets Against the War. Uh, passed away on May 1st, 76 years old, had a heart attack. Uh, my, uh, this Monday, Memorial Day, they're having a memorial, memorial for him as part of the usual Vietnam Vets Against the War uh, Memorial Day event, 11 a.m. to 12 noon at the uh, Vietnam Vets Gazebo, which is at Wabash and Wacker, followed at 1 o'clock. Um, by like an open mic at an art gallery for the name of the gallery. I think it's 3219 South Morgan, if I'm if I'm correct there. It's in the um, uh, it's in the uh, uh, what, what do you, what do you call that area? It's the um, it, it, uh, um, what do you call that? Uh, uh, Bridgeport area. Okay. Uh, so and that's all I know about it. I don't I don't have a phone number or anything for, to to oh, right. get more information about it. Oh, actually, there were and one other thing too. There wasn't there, there were several bits about him, uh, including in the New York Times and probably in the Sun Times. So it'll probably right. say more information there. All right. Seeing as how there's no more announcements, uh, we're going to get started. The speaking order is going to be Andy first, then it's going to be me. So uh, let's welcome up to the. Uh, Effervescent, uh, illustrious podium for the College of Complexes. Let's first welcome um, Andy Anderson to do his part of the speech on uh, how Trump's rigging the election. Go ahead, Andy. Let's give him a hand. Okay. All right, Andy, you're on. Uh, good evening. Tonight's, uh, can you hear that? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead, Andy. Tonight's talk is going to be divided up into two roughly equal halves. Uh, <clears throat> Tim is going to talk about the mechanisms, the legal mechanisms that are being put in place to install Trump, even though he loses the massive vote total 
by a landslide coming in November. They're, they're planning on uh, legally using the Electoral College to re-trigger the votes and just install Trump uh, no matter what we think. 80% of us could vote for Biden and Trump could still end up with a whole horde of MAGA criminals backing him. So, um, as I said, the presentation will be in two points, two parts. I'll take, I'm going to tell people roughly hit a few high points of what the country stands to lose if Trump and the MAGA criminals are able to take over. More than half the country is made up of women, women voters. I, number one on the list, number one on the list of things we lose should be <clears throat> the loss of all reproductive rights, uh, birth control treatment, anything, any birth control uh, measures that are used now, uh, pills, whatever, that's all going to be illegal. Uh, states are already passing laws to make that illegal. And they expect to go nationwide with those laws right after Trump gets elected. People need to realize uh, the one one thing. Hello. I'll make notice this so that the people on Zoom can see it. One thing that is not not taught in law schools, and people are unaware of. Think about it. Nothing illegal happened in Germany. Well, yeah, that's debatable. They made it legal. Well, they what what the Germ in Germ that's Germany with a big Y. My hand shook a little bit. So we'll just set this up here as our first thought of the day. <clears throat> we have people claiming that it's all, all legal to shoot college protesters because it's against the law to protest or create any kind of disturbance. So we're heading very closely, rapidly toward another Kent State where the National Guard just gunned down a bunch of students that were protesting the Vietnam War. All of the rights to protest, everything, women's rights, that's all gone by uh, December 1st, basically, for when the Trump MAGA people take over. They're not going to wait for Biden to leave the White House. Once they get control, this is going to turn into a police state. Second thing that should be of concern to everybody, especially women, is no more, no more voting rights. They're passing laws right now, in, in case you missed it, because it wasn't in the news. Our Supreme Court, which is the finest, as I've said, the best dressed, smoothest running intellectual legal whorehouse on the planet. It's six prostitutes and three decent people. And so they are able to pass laws saying this crime against humanity is legal. This crime is legal. Oh, you, had, you thought you had the right to vote? No, au contraire. If you're a black person living in a black area city, it is legal now for the state to use a computer to remove your names from the voter rolls. That used to be called racial discrimination, right? Now the Supreme Court ruled, that's not racial discrimination, that's just discrimination against voters. That's, that's political discrimination, and that's completely legal under our new laws. So picture a whole bunch of blue states with tens of millions of Democrats being chucked off the voter rolls by the Republican governors. That's coming. It's already happening in states. Number three on the list, no more push for solar, wind, energy efficiency, a green future. All of that will be defunded. They'll pass, they're passing laws now to make it very difficult for solar companies to survive. Onerous taxes, fees, all kinds of stuff. You can't have net metering uh, where you sell the electricity back to the utility, you know, your excess. Destruction of the solar and wind industry and the promotion of fossil fuels everywhere. They plan to dig for oil 
in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and everywhere else where the Exxon Valdez went down. Also, they plan to open a whole bunch more oil wells out near where the deep water horizon blew up with British Petroleum in 2010. Just burn, baby, burn. Drill, drill, drill everywhere. That's the motto. And Trump has said that in public. In fact, if you missed it, because MSC, MSNBC was the only network to cover Trump's meeting with oil billionaires in his office. He said, you give me a billion dollars to get elected, and I will give you all kinds of tax breaks. Uh, we'll get rid of all the laws that prevent you from drilling on federal lands. It'll be Christmas tree, Christmas time for oil companies, 65, 365 days a year. Uh, one article said that a billion dollars invested will give them a return of $120 billion a year in profits. Well, you know, it's a thousand percent, two thousand, eleven thousand percent, they said, rate of return on your invested. That's what it means to invest. If you're a billionaire predator pimp, you invest in one of your intellectual prostitutes like Trump. Joe Manchin, Clarence, Clarence Thomas is showing us in broad daylight what a Supreme Court justice intellectual prostitute looks like. He's just demonstrating it in person, and the other five aren't far behind it. Another thing we've taken for granted all these years, I've been giving speeches here since 27 when things went non-smoking. I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so I can't have a dinner anywhere in a restaurant where they're smoking. So since when we went non-smoking, since 2007, 2007, I've been giving speeches here on censored news, free speech, so some people violently object to telling the truth on certain subjects. Other people, uh, when it was in person, won't mention any names, but people used to come here in person because it was fun just to heckle the speaker like Bug House Square or something, or a soapbox debate. Well, this isn't Bug House Square. This is a free speech forum where we have rules, supposedly, one full of time and no personal attacks. What does this have to do with Trump? Charlie, shut up and let the speaker speak. I thought he was going to talk about Trump. Is Trump he going is. to bother him? Hit it. Hit it. As I just said, censorship happens whenever you talk about something that somebody else doesn't like and they feel free to chime in and just shout you down. Well, talk about the topic. I just did. That's, what, that's what's coming. No free speech. That's next on my list, Charlie. We've, been, we've had free speech here supposedly, but next on the list is no fair trials in the courts. And um, no, no free, uh, no freedom to assemble peacefully in protest. Right now, they're using police with batons and rubber bullets to shut down free speech on campuses. Trump wanted to give the order just to shoot people off across the street from the White House to clear the area so he could walk across there and hold up a Bible. But cooler heads prevailed, and uh, one of the generals told him, I said, no, uh, this is America. You can't just shoot people on the street if they're protesting. That's the mindset of Trump. As I said, see Clarence Thomas and the other five. Now, on the other half, if Trump is defeated and any Democrat gets control of the White House, and if the Democrats are able to get control of both houses of Congress, we stand a chance at a livable future. We have a chance to restore women's rights. In fact, many Republicans have said the first thing they're going to do if we can get control, if common sense people can get control of the government, they're going to reverse Roe versus Wade and, and pass, a constant, pass an amendment or a bill or whatever is in Congress to make it the law of the land. They will, they will pass laws making universal voting a right for everybody. So you can't be discriminated against race, color, creed, income, whether you just got out of prison. Voting will be a right like it is in most other modern democratic countries. 
they want to produce, they recognize that if we, if we have a chance at a livable future, we're looking at 190 feet of water frozen in the ice. 190 feet of sea level is currently frozen in the ice in South America, South um, Antarctica, the South, you know, South Pole. That ice is melting 100 years faster than they thought it would. We're looking at a sea level rise of 20 to 30 feet within this century, maybe way more if nothing is done to curb emissions. So a rapid expansion, we pour money into solar, wind, green, everything, a better environment, then we stand a chance of having a livable environment. Here's a, a, a number you should all memorize. Can everybody see this? Did I write it big enough? Uh, solar, what solar power, the silicon panels and everything, what cost uh, for the same amount of electricity? It was $2,800 in 1988. Today, that same electric output of solar is $100. It's $2,800 in 1988. Today, it's 100 And that was, this was a couple of years ago. The price is still dropping. Another factor, uh, fact that everybody should remember, whoops, that's the wrong timer. Mark this one on your calendar and memorize it. The ratio is when you talk to people about a little of future, the ratio is 10,000 to one. That is 10,000 times more light falls on the planet every day than what the human race uses in, in energy, total energy. One hour of solar intake, one hour of sunlight, would provide us enough energy to run the human race for a year, everything. And that number is, uh, is solar and wind are getting cheaper, but the ratio is still 10,000 to one. So there's no excuse for promoting any kind of fossil fuel or nuclear power anywhere on the planet. What is that again? Somebody just asked what? Yes, she asked, what is that again? Just. Oh, okay, I'll repeat this because it's one of the most important things you can learn heading forward to our clean, clean, green future. When anybody tells you that solar and wind are enough to provide the energy use, here it is. Solar power itself, the sunlight gives us from that fusion reactor out there 93 million miles away. We get 10,000 times more energy that falls on a planet as light than what the human race uses. If we collect just one ten thousandth of it every day, we don't need any coal, any oil, any nukes, no coal, oil, oil, fossil fuel, gas, or nukes. We can run it, and that's not counting the benefits of geothermal or hydropower or wind power. This is just solar. We're bathed in free energy that's given to us by our fusion reactor out there that we've known as the sun for thousands of years. One hour of solar intake in one hour, enough light falls on the planet to run everything for a year if we collected that sunlight for just an hour. Think about that. And it's Rocky Mountain Institute is one of the main uh, sources that gives you uh, beneficial, hopeful examples of how solar and wind power are gaining all over the world and how buildings are being built now with no heating system down. Just cooling system take out the body heat of the people. That's common knowledge. Write this website down and uh, make make note of it everywhere because it's this is the single most hopeful site that I know of that publishes middle of the road or what do you call common sense forensic evidence. This is not a political bent either way. There's no conspiracy series on this site. It's it's reader supported by donations. They have no advertising, no no big pharma or big oil companies are involved in supporting this site or censoring the news on it. It's called want to know dot info. Can everybody see that? Want to know dot info? I think they're getting that on the Zoom, Tim. I just, I just, I just, uh, 
put it in the chat too. So okay, want to know info? Uh, they have huge archives of beneficial knowledge of what we can do to help people. Uh, they have a whole section on energy, uh, close to free energy machines, high efficiency cars, homes. That's there's 12 different disciplines on that site. They've got uh, 13,000 documented articles of beneficial knowledge on a whole variety of things. The only hope we have in having meetings of free speech like this, rather than just get together and talk about the weather and the Cub scores, if that's what you want to do at the college, okay, but I won't be among you after November 5th. If then go. What? Hey, are you leaving? After November, I'm, I'm, I, I don't plan to leave, Charlie, but I don't plan to get killed and arrested for talking about things that Trump doesn't like, because Trump is, is going to have a police force out there that will be arresting people talking about things that we're going to be talking about tonight. A lot of the things we talk about tonight are going to be illegal after November 5th, after Trump gets elected. That's the point. And people that don't know that yet, Charlie, are terrifyingly ignorant of what's coming down the pike. This knowledge is in hundreds of books, thousands of articles. It's all over certain internet sites, but it's technically being blacked out by the media. The media runs coordinated blackouts on certain things so that it's called censorship by omission. If they don't talk about it, we don't find out about it. So whenever I hear, uh, whenever I'm talking to an acquaintance or something that says they think Donald Trump was a great president, I ask them, I just say, um, which would you prefer, a slow, steady pull or a sudden yank? And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, you have your head so far up your ass, it can't see daylight, so I'm here to help you pull it out. What do you want, a slow, steady pull or a sudden yank? But if you don't get your head out of the ass along with 30 other million zombies that rise up off the couch and head to the polls like the Night of the Living Dead, voting for Republican mega criminals, then our country has no future. This is where we are. We have kind, decent people. Incidentally, the, uh, there's a, a video introduction, 12-minute video that talks about this on the Want to Know Info site. It's a lady that describes how millions of kind, decent Americans have been misled by our media and the billionaires who control it for the last 60 years. Basically, what do they have? Okay, Jake, we know your hand's up. We'll take questions after Andy's in my presentation. Does he want a reference? Does he want a reference, Jake? Because if he wants a reference, I'll give him one right now. If, he, if that's a specific question. Jake, what's your question? No, no, I know that, but uh, Jake had his hand up for a specific reason. If not, we'll just keep going. Okay, from the time I have left here, I'm just going to run through three quick segments. One, got a little time, Andy. Go ahead. Where, where we are, we've been living through, in my lifetime, I've experienced 60 years of bald-faced lies. They lied to us about Vietnam. They lied to us about the assassination of Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy. They lied to us about getting into the Vietnam War. They lied to us about the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. They lied to us about the so-called uh, military buildup to catch up with the Soviets. That was all a total crock. We were never behind. Here's where we were in 1982. This book was published if you want to read something out of the history books, Reagan, it's, this was called Reagan, God, and the Bomb. It's now called America, God, and the Bomb. And published in 1982 by the Canadian Fred Melman, America, God, and the Bomb. It's a story of the five-year plan in the Reagan years to build $2 trillion worth of hardware. 
deploy those missiles all over the Soviet Union and then fire a sneak attack first strike in the spring of 87 to fulfill the Bible prophecy. The Bible clearly says America goes to glory winning World War III and we'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. Now, those were the top advisors surrounding Reagan back then, but there were some cooler heads. This book was published and caused a stir and people started thinking, uh, who are these people surrounding Ronald Reagan? Here's a book called With Enough Shovels. This is Thomas K. Jones from Boeing Aircraft. He, he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Operations. He was flying around the country teaching, having business seminars saying, there's no problem with nuclear wars. Every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. You dig a trench out back six feet deep, throw a couple of doors over it, leave a hole to crawl in, and you pile up dirt on one end of it three feet high. You, sit, you crawl in and sit under that three feet pile of dirt, and that will protect you from the radio cloud drifting over radioactive cloud after World War III. You can come out of your hole and get back to normal. The post office published a book. They said, we will deliver the mail after World War III, the nuclear war, even if we have to drive by and drop the mail in the hole in the ground where your house used to be, we'll deliver the mail. This is a kind of insanity that has been slowly infecting the Republican Party so that the Republican Party is no longer Republicans. It's made up of, of people that have basically no ethics, no morals, no conscience, and criminal tendencies. It's like they hung a big sign over the White House in 1980. If you have criminal tendencies that are willing to do anything to make money and help the billionaires, come on down. We got a job for you. David Ray Griffin published a book. To say, I think this was his 12th book after 9-11. The title is called Bush and Cheney. Bush and Cheney, How They Ruined America and the World. Most of 9-11 was the poisonous tree planted in the psyche of America so that it would, as Donald Rumsfeld said, now that 9-11 happened, the American people are going to be behind the military. We're going to take out seven countries in five years. That is, we're going to eliminate, bomb the crap out of seven of Israel's enemies and reshape the Middle East and make it friendly for the American oil companies. All throughout the Middle East and many places around the world, America is known as the largest killing machine on the planet. Did, did they plan that? Okay, that was. Yes, Has it been proved that they planned Yeah, that? Uh, the, somebody asked, did they plan 9 11? Yeah, 9 11 was planned several years in advance of 9 11, and it was done and coordinated by people within the Bush Cheney administration and the Israeli Mossad. Four buildings came down on 9 11, the other three the next few days. All seven buildings were destroyed as a giant real estate fraud. But the media, the media was fully on board. They sold it as an attack by crazy. You're money. getting off topic. If Bush had, if Bush, if Bush, if Bush had changed, if Bush had, cha if Bush had planned it out, it went. All right, go ahead. Uh, I'm standing here next to the podium. If we get too much more flack from the Zoom, I will walk behind me and pull the plug. And we will shut the Zoom down tonight and talk to people in the audience. So Aren't you just been the topic. You've been forewarned, Charlie. That means you and everybody else. We're not going to put up with this shit tonight. We're going to get through our talk. So just stay quiet and listen. You you have a rebuttal time. Yes, we do have the rebuttal time. And I also want to remind our illustrious leader that he's one of the biggest rule violators here in the college. We're not going to hear about okay, here's a, we're, we're talking about what's coming. What, what the Republican Party, the MAGA Party, wants to do. They want to expand the military actions. What's described in this book by Nick Terse, it's called Kill Anything That Moves. That was the My Lai Massacre was uh, sold to us by the media as a one-off uh, guy went crazy and ordered his troops to kill a bunch of people. Uh, no, that, that was uh, an operation that was going on all over Vietnam. And our current president and President Trump both uh, support those kind of actions in the Middle East, especially the genocide that's going on in the 
in Gaza right now. It's a genocide. It's not a, it's not a war between Hamas, Hamas Hamas, and, and Israel. When the kill ratio is 100 to 1 on one side, that's not a war. That's a slaughter. Lastly, I'll, I'll leave you with this one last thought before, before we go to uh, Tim's. In, in the last uh, every now and then there's a phenomenon it's relatively rare because if a book is a bestseller the author can book speaking tours the author can book book signings at bookstores or uh, venues wherever well Vincent Bucliosi wrote a book about the crimes of the Republican administration that predated the crimes of the Trump administration. The title of his book was called The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. This was published around 2007. And its author, uh, that is the, uh, the agent of Vincent Bugliosi, who was world famous as an author and a prosecutor, he said, I have to resign. I, I, I can't, nobody will, will touch this book or let you talk about it. And so a lot of people didn't know that any, any attorney general in any state that had lost a, a man in Vietnam, he could have prosecuted George for murder for what he did. George, just, George and Dick Cheney ran a killing spree for eight years in other countries. And that, that's, that's part of our history that's, that's not in the news. The current history that's being blacked out that's big is in this book is a nationwide bestseller for 24 months. It's a huge bestseller and you can't buy advertising for it on TV, Facebook, newspapers, anywhere. The media, there's no bad reviews. There is no reviews. They're, they're pre pretending it doesn't exist because the man actually put together forensic evidence from hundreds of people and, and told the truth. He summarized the whole ball of wax about what Anthony Fauci has been doing for the last four years. It's called The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Health. The COVID epidemic was not just about sickness. It's about the lockdowns, about turning our country into a place where people are going to be carrying digital IDs, in digital bank accounts and everything else and totally regiment that's that's the game plan for the future they just use the covid lockdowns as a start for it the real anthony fauci so anybody wants to browse through these books later uh come up and see me with that i think i'll turn it over to tim and he can tell you what what their plans are for implementing a lot of this coming up in november all right i'm going to be going up there shortly to join everybody i'm going to get a PowerPoint going with it, and I'm going to have somebody assist me with it. So just bear with me while I get the uh, stuff set up real fast and uh, get it running here so that uh, and you'll be able to see me in a uh, in thing. I'm just going to have our um, an assistant go here. So just give me a second and I'll get right started. OK. All right. And I'm just going to ask you to bring me uh, Okay. All right, I'm going to move a little forward so I can see the uh, screen a little bit. Move the podium a little forward a little more. There's a timer here if you want to set it up here. Okay, you'll be okay? Yeah, as soon as I get everything hooked up on the Zoom, we're all set. Okay. Now I am getting a little bit older, so I got to switch to my reading glasses here. And that's what we're going to do real quick, so bear with me. Be like George Washington when he did that whole thing when he switched his reading glasses on. <laughs> we are getting a little bit older. Well, as you can see, it's a comprehensive summary of the Republican criminals who are willing to steal the 2024 election. And I want to thank you for joining me today. 
as we stand at the precipice of yet another critical election. It is imperative that we remain vigilant and informed about the mechanisms that uphold our democracy. Today, we'll provide a comprehensive summary of the individuals and strategies within the Republican Party who are allegedly plotting to steal the 2024 election through legal loopholes and our voting laws. Can you hit the next slide, please? The, um, the importance of election integrity is very integral to our society. Every citizen's vote must be counted fairly and accurately to represent the will of the people. However, recent developments have raised significant concerns and attempts to subvert this process. These actions, while technically legal, under, threaten to undermine the very foundations of our economic system. Um, can you hit the next slide, please? Once on the space bar. I just did it, didn't I? I might. Uh, okay, well. Do you want another one or no? This just do it again. See what happens. Okay, there we go. Um, oh, boy. Can you go backwards? Uh, yeah, I got to get. Uh, don't worry. Just leave it on slide four there. Okay. Actually, we can. You want. Okay, that's all right. In the historical context, to understand the current situation, it is helpful to look back at the history of election manipulations, gerrymandering, voter suppression, and legal challenges have been used for decades to influence electoral outcomes. However, the sophistication and brazenness of these tactics have evolved, particularly in recent years. There is mounting evidence to suggest that certain factions within the Republican Party are actively seeking to exploit legal loopholes and gain unfair advantage in the 2024 election. These strategies, while varied, can be categorized into two, into several key areas. The first one is voter suppression laws. And over the last four years, numerous states within Republican controlled legislatures have enacted laws to make it more difficult for certain groups to vote. These laws include stricter ID requirements, reduced early voting periods, and limitations on mail and ballots. These measures that disproportionately affect minority, elderly, and young voters, groups that traditionally vote Democratic. Redistricting and gerrymandering. Redrawing district lines to favor one party over another is a long-standing tactic. However, with the 2020 census data now available, there is a renewed effort to redraw districts in a way that dilute the voting power of all opposition groups Thus, gerrymandering can create a significant advantage for Republicans in both state and federal elections. And of course, election subversion beyond voter suppression and gerrymandering, there are more direct threats to our electoral process. Um, some Republican leaders have advocated for giving state legislatures more power over election outcomes, including the ability to overturn results they deem fraudulent. This could lead to situations where the popular vote is disregarded in favor of partisan decisions. Legal challenges and vote packing. The judiciary plays a considerable role and yeah, it just admit him. Uh, okay, there you go. Um, the judiciary plays a critical role in interpreting election laws. He has been coordinated efforts to appoint judges who are sympathetic to these strategies. Additionally, Preemptive legal challenges to voting laws and procedures are being filed to create a more favorable legal landscape in their strategies. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. And uh, all right. Um, let's delve into the key figures and groups involved in these efforts. The first one is the state legislatures. Republican-controlled legislatures in states like Georgia, Texas, and Arizona have passed laws that restrict voting access. For example, Georgia's State Bill 202 imposes new ID requirements for absentee ballots, limits the use of ballot drop boxes. Secretary of States and election officials. These, official role, these officials play a critical role in overseeing elections. In some states, efforts are underway to replace nonpartisan or Democratic officials with those who are more likely to support these control strategies. For example, the Georgia, the, in Georgia, the Secretary of State Office has been a focal point for these efforts. Political action committees and advocacy groups. 
Groups like the Heritage Foundation and the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALAC, have been instrumental in drafting and purporting these restrictive voting laws. They provide model legislation and legal support to state legislatures pushing these agendas. And uh, can you hit the next slide, please? As we are keeping on going with the election subversion, um, key politicians and influencers. Um, go one more, please. And then uh, one more after that. I'm look, getting off a okay, little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Now, amongst the key players and strategies, we already mentioned state legislatures, secretaries of state and election officials, political action committees and advocacy groups, key politicians and influencers, figures such as former President Donald Trump and allies of Trump made baseless claims of widespread voter fraud. These claims served to justify implementation of restrictive voting laws and other measures aimed at undermining public confidence in the electoral process. And the impact upon democracy, you wanna hit the next slide, please. Is that the one? Okay, and we just basically uh, hit a lot of that same stuff. So go on to the next one, please. All right, and uh, one more, slide 11. So, okay, well, one more. Mm -hmm. What can be done? Well, what can be done is simply, uh, let's, what can be done is it's very much things. The, it requires a multifaceted approach. The first one is legislative action. Federal legislation, such as the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act aims to protect and expand voting rights. Advocating for passage of these laws is critical. Public awareness and advocacy Raising awareness about these issues and mobilizing public opposition can pressure lawmakers to act. Um, I'm sorry. Legal challenges. Courts can serve as a check on unconstitutional or overly restrictive voting laws. Supporting legal challenges to these laws is essential in protecting voting rights. Uh, next slide, please. Election. Um, Okay. Uh, election monitoring and oversight, voter education and mobilization. Educating voters about their rights and how to navigate voting laws is critical. <laughs> Mobilizing voters, educating voters, particularly those from affected group, from affected elected discriminatory groups can counteract some of the suppressive effects of these laws. Next slide, please. I guess the end. No, there's 17 of them. So there's another one there. I'm hitting stuff. Stop. Well, anyway, uh, there are legal challenges. Okay, hang on here a minute. Because we should have a couple more in there. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, let me. Yeah. It's all right. Can you just stay right yeah. there. And, uh, uh -huh. See, I hit. No, it's all right. We got it. I could see all of them. As Tim has been all in telling you, he's running through a whole list of things that we can do when we still have the right to vote and make changes. If we don't have the right to vote anymore, or uh, he, our voices won't be heard, then all of these things he's listing as positive ways to change, that'll all be gone after the, at the installation of Trump. Now, Trump won't get elected. He won't get a majority of the votes. He lost by a landslide the last time, but they were able to legally uh, gerrymander the uh, Electoral College and put him in. So uh, we have to get the message out to everybody that our, our whole system is under attack. Right now, we have the rights to speak up, as Tim is talking about here. We have, we have these legal rights to affect change on a variety of fronts, but if we don't use them between now and November, then it's anybody's guess what's going to happen. Thank you. All right. We're going to be just a second here because I'm going to kind of wrap up real fast. And we're going to go from. Yeah. Oh. We're just going to go from the current slide. It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
the truth of the matter is we could go on and on and on about Trump and his elective challenges and some of the things that can go in. Although I don't agree a lot with some of the more extreme views of Andy, we do agree on one thing. And that is the election of Donald J. Trump will probably be the somewhat darkening of American skies and American things. See, Bishop Fulton Sheen years ago, back in the 50s, talked about something called Covetus America, meaning that America was founded on the principles of Thomas Jefferson, that our laws and rights came from God, and that what followed was the dignity of man. And that's been serving us for quite a while. But what's been happening in the last few years is we've actually following some of the teachings of Saint San Just, a follower of Robespierre from the French Revolution. Hmm. And what he says is that our rights come from the government and if the government could give them, the government could take them away. And that the violence uh, that's used hmm. will be the benefit of the will of the state and not the uh, essence of what we can do when we follow God and what happens. So Covatus America, let's hope we keep choosing the rule of Jefferson rather than that of St. Sanjus. Next slide, please. I'm gonna close now with some good words of what we really believe in the United States of America and why Thomas Jefferson and whatever goes through. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the general. Next slide, please. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it or institute new government laying its foundations on such principles and powers in such form as they shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And I'm gonna ask now to try, stop sharing the screen so you can see me clearly. I'll get that real quick here. That contradicts the slide you just showed. No, <laughs> the slides no, contradict one another. I just, that's great. Charlie, would you not get off? We're trying to get some technical stuff cleared up here, please. No, I'm trying to get this down here now. I'm trying to get, damn it. There we go. Okay. All right. And do you know how to make your the featured Don't person? Don't worry about it. Well, they can see me here in the audience and on Zoom. All right, guys. I know it's a little bit uh, rickety with technology again, but I am going to say this. Our Declaration of Independence was founded, and I think it's not so much the revolution that occurred in 1776. Okay. Was it was the uh, e event that really helped the United States, but it was the Constitutional Convention, and what was said there, and its adoption, and the Bill of Rights that really helped us out in that uh, format. So now, what I'm going to do is just ask everybody to really consider what version of the country that you want to see. What version do you want? Do you want a dark dictatorship? or somebody trying to keep on power, because that's exactly what we rebelled against with King George back in 1776. Or do you want a country that you still values human life and freedom? Although me and Andy may not agree on a lot of the same external externalities, we both agree that Donald Trump is a fundamental danger 
and the Heritage Foundation's 2024 20, Project 2025 plan will somewhat just will, will get rid of our liberties. So with that, I'm going to ask all of you to do one thing this November. Go out and vote. If you agree with Donald Trump and his vision of the future, vote for him. Vote if you don't, him. then then join me and everybody else who is now beginning to see the uh, crackpot for who he is and prepare for what he's doing. Let's get him off the ballot. Remember, um, Jesus did, too, have a lot to say about politics in his end. He talked to the Sadducees and the Pharisees of his time. And because of their hypocritical behavior, call them, you brood of vipers, you den of thieves. And he lambasted them quite a bit. I think today that with the Trump and the Republican Party would somewhat be the same party of the Pharisees that we see today in, in Scripture. So whether you like it or not, we don't want the... Uh, Pharisaic party of the Republicans running. That doesn't mean the Democrats don't have their thoughts either, but they seem to be a little bit more normal as far as political <laughs> stuff's concerned. With that, I'll conclude my remarks and go to questions. Okay. And now, uh, can I uh, have somebody help me up here with the Zoom um, on questions? All right. I'll take a few. The first one, yes. Go ahead, loud, please. I would have to say, I'm wondering if the Republicans, when it comes to stealing elections, both parties have done that. Yes, they have. Matter of fact, Biden stole it in 20. Well, that's okay. Come on up. Well, we'll. Come on up and get up here, and you can you can explain it. Then go ahead, go ahead and give us a couple questions. Go ahead. He was part of the problem. You needed a dictator to sort out the problem he caused. Napoleon was far better in his dictatorial. Sometimes you need a malevolent dictator. So you think that Trump would be a good one? Well, basically, I see Trump is still, it's going to be much better than Biden. Okay, They're well. They're both bad. It's just a matter of which one you think is worse. Okay. Can I ask a question? Now, yeah, yeah, come on up and ask the question, since you're, you know, and I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, just go right ahead and go take the mic. Sure. Um, first, I have three questions, so I hope you'll give me some time. Yeah, so this is to both you and Andy. Um, if you couldn't vote for Trump or Biden, uh, who would you choose? If your if your cho if your choice is limited to Jill Stein, RFK Jr., Cornell West, and the Libertarian part, uh, candidate, uh, who would you vote for? I would probably say more than anything else. Uh, probably Cornell West. The reason I say that is he's the most reasonable amongst RFK. I don't like RFK's extreme views. And I've heard Cornell West speak before, and I think he would be a decent uh, president. Okay, Andy, go ahead. I would vote for RFK because he's ahead of the curve. His views aren't extreme. He's telling the truth, and he's being called an extremist by the mainstream media simply because he's stepping on the toes of the billionaire predators that own big pharma. Coach and our drug companies and uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Okay. Just say it. I for the last 20 years as an environmental scientist has been in the forefront of trying to protect children against all kinds of uh, environmental chemicals and pollution and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and when, when you, you get a law passed by Congress that prevents a company from polluting it cuts into their profits. Well, R.F. Kennedy is a uh, uh, side of many big businesses everywhere because he's absolutely telling the truth and it's documented. The only reason people are getting away with thinking he's an extremist because that's what you hear in the media. That book I held up, R.F.K. Jr., the real, real, uh, real Anthony Fauci, is that book is touted by uh, hundreds of scientists as uh, the definitive work on where we are with our pharmaceutical industry and what we have to do to start saving lives. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I see Charlie has his hand up. Does Charlie have a question? 
Yes. Uh, I always say you should avoid internal contradictions. Now, Tim, you showed a slide that said, according to Bishop Sheen, all rights come from God. Yes. And then the next slide, and you mentioned this even, is that we got our rights from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But why do you need, why did you need to? Because it's very simple, Charlie. The, the we, government is instituted amongst men so that they restrain themselves. And those rights in that Constitution are what guide those men. I'm not going to say that the rights derive from God and the Constitution is what defines those rights and limits on executive and legislative powers. It is a good system. As I said, the, sec the thing that made the American Revolution different from the others was the Constitutional Convention. And somebody like you, I'm surprised, is even questioning how that even can be said that there's a contradiction in those things. They are the same. And they come from God or government? They come from God and are defined by government. Yeah. Follow-up question. Do you think go you ahead. could go into a court of law and base your case on a right that you claim was given to you by God? Charlie, you know something? You think we could have a court system? <clears throat> oh, yes. That makes sense. It makes plenty of sense because the rights are legally defined in the Constitution and through you know the proper it's application of other law. laws and natural law. That is what defines What's natural those law. Rights. Yeah, Charlie, there's no natural. What's law. natural oh. law? One more question. It's what the heck is natural law? It's it's law you made law. up. Charlie, considering your socialistic background, you're probably uh, more Science. wanting to go after um, you know, Rogues Pierre and his cronies and the use of violence to uh suppress the laws and coming from government. You see, the thing is, there's a certain moral code that comes down from being a Christian and from a, 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 and trying to uphold certain conventionalities is dedicated by the Christian faith and other faiths around the world, such as, you know, not killing your neighbor, not coveting your neighbor's rights or your neighbor's goods or anything like that. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's going to do it. And there are people that are going to not follow the laws, and that's what we have police forces for in jails and terrorists. The thing, or the, I'm not terrorists, but I mean people to fight against them. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that we'll need law and order. Armies, armies. Jake, would you please uh, mute yourself? Oh, okay. Right. Do I have one quick follow-up, Tim? Go right ahead, Charlie, and then we'll move on to our next. Pope Pierre and his followers wrote a declaration of the rights and man, uh, just like our Bill of Rights. Yes, they did, and it made a big influence. You didn't mention that. Well, the thing is, they, is that those rights come from government. Rogues, huh? You see, the thing is, Charlie. Though the reason why America's remembered further, and the and the Bill of Rights, and, and I am aware of the Human Rights Articles of Conf of, of what. I'm aware of what happened during the French Revolution, a good aspirational document, one we should look at and follow. But the thing was, towards the end of the French Revolution with Robespierre, it was all guillotine, guillotine, guillotine. 14,000 people were killed because of the revolution as enemies of the state. And that's something that I think is crazy. How did St. Saint Ju Saint Juice become a saint? If he well, was no, a bad it, guy, it wasn't. Right? It was he was a bad guy, but his name was Saint. Oh, that Juice. was his name. <laughs> okay, that was his name. Okay, this Carrie has a question. Carrie's All right, wrote. Carrie, go ahead. I'm. 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 This. I'm really curious. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hear I'm, you. Really, I'm really curious. Do the people that support are support pushing Jill Stein? Do they really think? Do they not realize that anybody voting for Jill Stein makes yeah. it more likely that that Trump will be elected? Or do they think Trump, Trump is a better president than, than Biden, would be a better president than Biden? I'm, I'm really just curious about this. Um, repeat the question, because I didn't quite get it. Do the, are the people that are pushing Jill Stein, do they, are they really so, 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 so stupid they don't realize that their actions are more, make it more likely that Trump will be elected? Or do they, for some reason, think it would be better if Trump was elected? I'm, I'm really curious. 
So with people who I'm vote gonna, for I'm Joe Stein, uh, I'm going to yeah, let, uh, let Joe address come on up that. and you, yeah. you answer that because I'm not familiar with Jill Stein, but he's a Green Party guy. I recently joined the Green Party. Uh, Jill Stein is not a child molester. Joe Biden is. <laughs> but but she people say that well that I think that right the now and, and in Trump. 2016 I voted for the Libertarian Party candidates. Yeah. William Weld. That helped Biden. But William Johnson Johnson and Weld, and I was happy to cast it because I couldn't support wow. either candidate. Of, of either Hillary or Trump. Wow. But I wanted to vote for somebody. I have a question. Okay, and now, yeah. uh, all right, we're going to move on. Uh, Jake, oh, yeah. you have a question? Jake has a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Jake. Go ahead, Jake. You got a question? Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. My my question is getting back to the topic of the talk. Um, just want to we just want to know what what specifically are the Republicans? Um, uh, 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 what what are they uh, what are they planning in terms of disrupting the electoral vote count in in the event that in the event that Biden wins? I mean, I heard I heard some I heard some I heard some scary things on television the other night. I've been hearing some scary things. They they interviewed they interviewed several prominent Republicans and what they asked them is would you would you um, w- will you accept the outcome of the election uh, regardless of who wins and the in 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 everyone they asked including Tim Scott and I can't remember the names of the others but they're prominent Republicans and they also and they're all MAGA Republicans and they all said in this in so many words that they would they would accept the outcome of the election if Trump wins. If Biden wins the election, they don't accept the outcome of the election. That's what they implied. So my question is, what what are they planning to do to try to usurp the electoral vote count? Well, seeing as how we've already seen that play out in 2000, I think it'll try to be a rematch of the same thing. They'll challenge the elections, they'll challenge the vote counts. I detailed this clearly in my speech earlier today of several other things they might do. They might have try another insurrection, some other stuff like that. But, you know, the thing is, I think we've already seen this game play out in 2000. And there's gonna, they're going to try every dirty trick in the book. I mean, it's not that, 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 it's not that um, Democrats don't challenge elections either. But when you go to Trump, um, there were some 60 court cases and not a single one was proven in Trump. Okay, I'm going to let Ellen take the next question. Yeah. Yeah, the the question is what should we do? You know, given it's a game and they're they're playing dirty and there's, you know, if we voted for our ideal candidate, um, you know, then that might help Trump. You know, all the left-leaning people whether it's Jill Stein or Biden, it, it'll help Trump and I th- I think you're right that that Trump is the the greatest threat to America. Is it there a way for us to apply constitutional law or natural law to get Trump off the ballot? I I don't understand why ballot by Biden and Trump are the only ones that are going to make on the ballot. And it it seems that it's corruption of of really the process, but the the election. you know, how does somebody get on a ballot even though they're a criminal? Uh-huh. How can we stop it? It's a game. Well, I uh, think. Years, Ellen. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll get you next. Okay, I'm going to try to answer a question. <laughs> um, very simple, Ellen. We don't elect people of character anymore. Yeah. How they we... get on the ballot. There's a lot more machinations of the stuff and whatnot. Okay, I'm going to get your question next. Hang on a second while I get this guy in on. So, come on up. Can I go up there? No, I know I'm not. Jake's coming logging in again. So, I can answer that partly also. Uh, in the last, last 30 years or so, our elections have been controlled to a greater and greater degree every four years. 
by what I've been calling and many other people now call billionaire predators. They have enough money to buy advertising means to outspend a decent, honest person. Billionaire predators can pour money into an election to defeat virtually anybody that doesn't have a massive grassroots backing already uh, and they're you know immune to big money being poured into a candidate but most most we well we have a well we have a chance to do that now if we keep a democratic administration well we haven't done it already because of the citizens united uh, supreme court vote in 2010 that says billionaire predators can own and operate intellectual prostitutes masquerading as elected officials. That's what we got. Yep. A lot of politicians in Congress aren't politicians. They're prostitutes. Look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> They're not selling sex for a few hundred dollars here and there. They're selling their votes for tens of thousands. Hundreds of these people are millionaires. And they're owned and operated by billionaire predators. And that's, if we don't, language matters. Language matters. That's all I can say. We have to talk about it in real terms, face the reality of it. All right, you got the next question. Go ahead, sir. Well, uh, the uh, Democrats are trying to give the vote to 20 million illegal aliens. Isn't that stealing the election? That's stealing the election. Is that fact-based? Huh? Fact yes, 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 yes. Okay, They're doing it already. What's your source? Huh? <laughs> What's your source? I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question, Chair. I mean, uh, you, you know they're, lay, they're coming in 10,000 a day. What the? Don't you realize the uh, the uh, Marxist pro progressives? They, they're getting on the campus and making these students. They, they're getting them, uh, telling them all this progressive jive, and and they, they, they're trying to destroy the country. Don't you see that? You Marxist, you Marxist. I don't want to call your names. You're okay. That's okay. I don't, but I, I don't know that well, you know, the thing is, George does bring up a good point about a lot of the people coming in with immigration. Okay, now. No, no, it's, it's all right. Well, here, here's the thing about immigration. They don't get to vote. They don't get to vote unless they're citizens. Let him talk. And what happens is, is that um, we do have an immigration problem in this country. We do have uh, unsecure borders in this country. We do have we do have problems with people coming in and skipping the line, so to speak. The problem is not the immigration itself; it's the failure of Congress and the president to elect laws. I'm gonna say this once. One there, was a, con, there was a bipartisan bill that was making its way through Congress and that Donald Trump said, put a kibosh on it. We wanna win the next election and immigration will be our reform. He's taking the immigration issue and politicizing it. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, it's all good having these illegals come in because there are people that do wrong and do whatever coming in. The one thing I do want to tell everybody is that our demographics in this country are changing. We are starting to age as a population. We are going to be much more older people around here than younger people. And the countries that allow people to come in legally and assimilate legally will be those ones that prosper in the future. The reason I say this, the, well, the criminal, you know, it's we got enough here and it's statistically from what my understanding is there's a lot less crime in immigrant communities than there are in some of the white communities we see around here and whatever now let me check something because i think somebody else is coming in i, I got it okay you got, got it all right thank you sir can i ask one all right yeah go ahead and ask a question you, you got you're, you're next that's all right we george does raise a good point though if I could just provide a brief comment, I think we should have a national amendment that says undocumented immigrants can vote as long as they're not eligible to vote in other countries, in their home country. Just a thought, but I don't want to focus on that. So that you guys might be aware of something called the Interstate Popular Vote Compact, 
Um, 20 to 25 states have gotten together and said that no matter what, they will allocate their electoral votes according to whoever gets 50% or the most votes in each state. So I was wondering, Tim and Andy, whether you would support a national amendment to make all states uh, do that. Um, and I guess uh, I also want to ask, um, is the one man, one vote principle so important to you that you don't buy the argument that the Electoral College forces presidential candidates to visit low population states? Okay, thanks a lot. For what? That. Remember, this is question time. Are there any more questions from the audience? I can't. I, I can't yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the other guy. Andy. Andy. Go now, ahead. I used to be a book reviewer. I used to get, I used to get be sent copies of books to maybe consider writing a review for various publications as a freelance writer. Now, there's 50,000 books published every year, of which only a few hundred ever get a written review. I would get all kinds of goofy books, and I would sell them. I didn't write a review. And you claiming simply because a book is not reviewed by people like me that there's censorship? Maybe by any chance, is it a goofy book? Can I can I answer your question, Charlie? Go ahead. I'm waiting. You totally bastardized my statement. I never said what you just said. I didn't say that uh, just because a book doesn't get a review, uh, it doesn't mean anything. I, I said <clears throat> some books become nationwide bestsellers despite being censored and blacked out by the media intentionally. Because if they were reviewed, if they got reviews of what they actually were, the circulation would increase tenfold or a hundredfold. That's how might go down. That's how censorship functions, Charlie. And if you don't know that, I would suggest you start studying up on how Project Censor. You got to learn how the book business works, Charlie. Let him finish. Books that are no good. Let him finish, Charlie. Simply. One. That's why they're time, Charlie. Please. Don't you understand that? One fool at a time, we say. Yeah, one fool at a time, Charlie. The uh, <clears throat> Project Censored every year teaches journalism students how not to get fired and blackballed if you're going to be a journalist. Because journalists learn very early on from veteran, veteran journalists that have been fired and can't get hired in the media anymore. They're working as school teachers or truck drivers or whatever because they had the temerity to write a story that stepped on the toes of some billionaire predator. That's where we are in the country today. <clears throat> and it gets worse every year. Project Censored, the latest book is called The State of the Free Press. Uh, hold on a minute. He's got it there. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> Another one by Christina Borgesson in there somewhere. Uh, this one, is State of the Free Press 2024. It's just a little handbook, but it's got a summary of the top 25 stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And I've been talking about this ever since I've been giving speeches on the top 10 censored news. And Char <clears throat> Charlie doesn't want Charlie doesn't want to schedule any more speeches on the top 10 censored news because I talk about things that matter to people all over the country. And when people find out about it, they move in a different direction. And that's that's what Robert F. Kennedy's campaign is all about. He's talking about what's really happening. And uh, there's tons of books now that talk about who, who assassinated uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. I mean, John F. Kennedy, and it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. It was uh, the mob and the American CIA coordinated it. And the, and the Israeli Mossad has been involved. The Israeli Mossad and the CIA are heavily involved, at, heavily involved at the top levels of the American media. They were able to control what we see and hear and don't hear on sensitive subjects. That's why we're not getting a tenth or a fiftieth of the journalism we should get in the pictures coming out of the total complete destruction and genocide that's going on in Gaza. They're just bombing hospitals and bulldozing the rubble. 
parents are sent to here, here here's a bucket and a, you know, a bucket and a spoon go out and pick up see if you can find the pieces of your 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 young daughter after she was blown to bits by a 2000 pound american bomb i just read that book called kill anything that moves <clears throat> the last time the american press covered anything happening relating to war was in the vietnam war with the pictures that were coming out of vietnam so disgusted everybody even people running businesses in America said, we don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. And so they, they, they learned, they learned how to censor the press. And as the censorship has just gotten tighter and more coordinated every single year. So censor news as a uh, website, you can buy the book, you can log on and just read. <clears throat> and the want to know info site that I listed earlier, want to know info, that site is loaded with all kinds of stuff that we're talking about here tonight. You know, verified, verifiable. It's not somebody's opinion. It's documented, proven with all kinds of references. Thank you. Yeah, yeah to follow up on that, I think it's great that y'all are getting at freedom of association, freedom of speech. And can you say something about academic freedom? Because I noticed that there was a conference on academic freedom, and the speakers were were Jim Fetzer, who has spoken here twice, you know, um, on vaccines and on 9/11, two most censored news things there are. And um, what is academic freedom? It means that he was fired from every university job here. You know, went to Harvard, PhD. You know, um, but also Michael Parenti can't find a job. His book, Democracy um, Injustice for All or Democracy for the Few, um, teaches at college textbooks. And, you know, he also has a great book, History as Mystery, you know, that, you know, and, you know, fake news. I mean, the issues are all related to, you know, Public opinion, you know, and how can public opinion be formed? It's the freedom of the press. We have to have a free press. That's Julian Assange is bringing us together around that. But, you know, in order to have freedom of thought, freedom of opinion, you know, and, um, you know, so it all goes back to journalistic freedom, right? And, um, if, and that is natural law, right? If, if constitutional law is... Is this a rebuttal? Uh, it, it's uh, okay. I'm just, I would like Andy to speak to uh, yeah, academic freedom, but also natural law versus constitutional law. One is, you know, we're following these laws because you have a separation of powers. That's not natural law. We invented this constitution by men, for men, by, you know, and the thoughts and the philosophy came from the collective understanding of a social contract. Okay, Rousseau. Okay, so speak to all of these things, but it's all about intellectual freedom, academic freedom. We, if, if they can black out and censor things, that's, we, you know, that's how we got Trump and Biden. Okay. okay, well, anyway, Andy, do you have anything else to say? Because otherwise, we should just go into rebuttals now. <clears throat> yeah, there's a book for those of you that want to know more about what Ellen just talked about, about academic freedom and and how the media functions. And I would uh, strongly suggest Charlie read this one book if he never has. But like Charlie says, he's absolutely correct. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of books and there's no time every year to read anything but a fraction of them. I, speci I specifically seek out books on censored news, stories that would change the country overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out and uh, books that are written by people with high credibility not um, reporters from Fox News. So the, the book I would suggest to everybody is one called Into the Buzzsaw. It was written by Christina Borgesson, published in around 2004. And it has a story of like 18 Pulitzer Prize winning journalists. They all, all had good careers. Uh, Gary Webb, uh, anyway, um, a bunch of people. They got fired and blackballed for trying to inform the American people about the truth of a specific event, like the crash of uh, Flight 800 off the coast of 
New York in 1996. Our, our Navy shot it down with a dummy missile. And they didn't want anybody to know about that, so she got fired at ABC Television News. Anyway, uh, that book, this, that book and the censored news books, <clears throat> and also uh, Noam Chomsky's work, there's a classic book called Manufacturing Consent. Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman, published back in 1984, I guess, some 40 years ago. They talked about how the media manufactures the consent of our public to vote for certain things, not having any idea what's going on. So that's where we are today. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, All right, um, we're gonna go to, okay, Sid, I'm gonna take your last question and then no, we'll go, question. we're going to rebuttals. Yeah, My concluding remark from the book of Ecclesiastes, of the making of many books, there is no end and much study wearies the body. For this, for in the end, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is some of the whole existence of man. Chapter, think 30 in Ecclesiastes on, under Solomon and what he concluded like. We're now going to rebuttals. I'm going to give everybody five minutes. Uh, he's going first. You'll go second. So you should stay there. I'll move the camera on you and bring the mic over. We're going to start in uh, everybody, everybody about five minutes. Go right ahead. Start, sir. D Donald Trump is a flawed, is a flawed candidate, but he is on the right side of these issues. These are core principles of Republican conservatives. In the, number one, individual freedom. We support the Constitution and property rights. Two, limited government. We, we support individual liberty and limited power. Three, rule of law. The uh, the, we, we want to prosecute crime and maintain order. The, the Democrats aren't doing that. You can see. I don't know why you people can't see what's going on. Uh, peace, peace through strength. Strong military. Defend Western culture. Biden walked away from Afghanistan with 80 billion supplies. He left Americans. He, he, he encouraged all this happening in, in Ukraine and in Taiwan, all over the world because they see he's weak. Fiscal responsibility. We, we Republicans oppose the, the $34 trillion national debt. Uh, uh, we, su we support reduced government spending. Free markets, free trade, economic expansion. We're for economic expansion. America is unique. We support American values. The U.S. political, political system and the historic, historical record, like what we did in World War II. We won the war, but we even helped our enemies. I mean, we're the best. We're the best. But now the Chinese and Russians are, and the progressives are trying to bring us down. Okay, uh, American conservatives, we support Christian values, traditional family, lower taxes, deregulation, gun rights, second amendment. Military spending, strong national defense, marriage between men and women, school choice, social order, pro-business, pro-capitalism. That's what we conservatives support. Uh, the, the American conservatives uh, oppose abortion rights. We, 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 and Trump backs limited rights are okay. It's not abortion across the board. We oppose same-sex marriage transgender rights, illegal immigration, marijuana legalization, affirmative action, woke culture that teaching little kids about sex. You, you gotta know what's happening. We oppose unjust legal system. Look what they're doing with Trump. I know he did things, but the Democrats are still, okay. Uh, American conservatives oppose Marxist, yeah, Marx. Marxist progressives, uh, let me say, American conservatives oppose Marxist progressives destruction of America. They're trying to destroy the country. We cannot tolerate four more years of Biden administra administration. We can't, we can't have another four years of this. They, they, they brought in 20 million illegals. Do I have time? That's about it, right? Continue, please. Well, that's all I wanted to say. And uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, progressives, the, 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 in Congress, there's 435 representatives, only 97 progressives, but they have outsized influence. They have Biden's ear. They have uh, uh, Mayor Johnson's ear. And, and they're not in the majority, but we're too dumb to, to, to fight them. We got to fight these progressives. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. I you. agree. Thank you. All right, next rebuttal, and then we'll go. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm going to address my comments to a couple of different people, including our presenters. Um, first, to speak to what George just said, I could never be a Republican because I'm too strongly pro-immigrant and too strongly pro-Gaza for their tastes. But you should listen to at least some of what George said, even if you disagree, because kids being taught too much about sex in school is a serious problem. There was a 14 or 15 year old African-American girl in a high school in North Carolina and a transvestite twerked, danced on top of her, gave her a lap dance in front of her school at a school event. So stuff like that is really happening. Um, you guys mentioned the abortion ban uh, and, and national abortion ban amendment. I just want to let you guys know, um, CNN reported on April 10th that Trump said he would veto such an amendment. So what's going to happen is most likely that if Trump gets elected, it'll be the House and Senate GOP uh, pressuring Trump to uh, support such an amendment. You guys can feel free to comment on that if you want to. Um, Andy, thank you for bringing up Kent State and the shooting of protesters. A uh, detail that was left out was that you probably guys already know this, but uh, 300 students at Columbia University were arrested, uh, mostly for trespassing. And there's kind of a culture um, of thinking that running over protesters is funny, like uh, especially on the right, sorry to say. Um, but when we confront these people, whether in line or in per online or in person, we should remember to say, um, we are not blocking traffic, we are traffic. That's what you say when people are being run over by cars for just walking in the street. Um, some, uh, Ellen asked about how the Bushes ruined America and uh, I want to mention George Bush's brother, Marvin Bush. Um, this is according to commondreams.org. Marvin Bush was a director at Stratasec, which was part of a company called Secur Securicom for uh, 1993 to 2000. And that company was capitalized by the Kuwaiti American Corporation, which is linked to the Bushes. So there's evidence that Marvin Bush could have uh, messed with the security response to 9 11. There's evidence that Cheney might have as well. I'm glad to hear you guys be open to the possibility that uh, Democrats are rigging elections too. Um, some examples of that are uh, some people seem to think the Clintons helped finance the first Yeltsin campaign and helped get him into power. And you might also want to look into the death of a politician. I think it was Ohio, either Ohio or Georgia, named Stephanie Tubbs Jones. It's possible she might have been killed by a Democratic rival. I don't want to say too much. Feel free to research Stephanie Tubbs Jones' suspicious death. Um, and I just want to comment on natural, natural law. Uh, that's equal freedom. So just to clear something up about our rights, rights don't have to come from God in order to not come from government. There's a phrase called nature and nature's God. Uh, you don't have to be religious to believe that our rights come from our humanity and the fact that we have a mind and a brain and judgment and are capable of reason um, to believe in rights not coming from government. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. No, that, that's good. Yeah. All right, next rebutter, please. That's Sid, right? Oh, Sid, yeah. Okay. All right, let me, you want to stay there, Sid? Yeah, I'll just stay. All right, let me, uh, I'm gonna just uh just just hand him the computer mic. Sid, I'm just gonna have Sid the computer mic because he can I'm just gonna sit right there and the people in the background can hear him because we can hear him fine in here. Just, 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 yeah, just just go ahead. Well, actually the country for now, the only people that could vote was white men with property. Women couldn't vote. The Indians couldn't vote, the slaves couldn't vote, and that was how we started. Now, as far as progress is concerned, if we look into anything that was progressive, we find we had a struggle for it. At first, when people worked, they worked maybe 12 hours a day. I remember reading something from Carson Ferry Scott and Company. This was around 
the 1900s and when it's sitting there, they have to come early in the morning, clean up around their workplace, and make everything speak and stand so they could open at a certain time and people could get what they wanted. And the only time they could get off is on Sunday, only if they brought something from the preacher or the priest saying they came to the service on that particular day. Otherwise, they had to work. So work was like a form of slavery. They didn't have no unions. In merry old England, they called them combinations. And if they had two more people getting to together and saying we want improvements on their work site and we don't want to work all those hours, they couldn't do it. They would be arrested. So everything that was ever um, put forward for progress was caused by people struggling. The women's movement didn't take place until 19... One year, when they got the uh, right to vote. So that also, they looked down on women. Remember, um, there was um, a progressive woman, I can't remember her name right now, but she went to Harrow, Indiana, where deads went. And when people came to hear, hardly anybody would show up. But then made it like Rosen? Yeah, I'll be back on. All right, thank you.
Sorry yeah. about that, guys. We had some trouble with the. Uh... Okay, can you hear me? Uh, this is Ellen Corley. Um, Going to ask the next question, and I wanted Charlie. Hey, to... hang on, hang on, Ellen. We got to get back to connected here. All right, can you get? Uh... Shit, did you hear her? Okay, yeah, I know, but I'm trying to get the video started too again. Okay, the video. Uh... Sorry about this. I'm having some te That's technology right. problems. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask how Charlie is on the there. I would like to speak at the next, when we, there's a free speech forum day when they have the thing down at Boathouse Square. Um, is that date available, Charlie? That, is that July? I saw you had two dates in July. Um, could I speak on the free speech day? about free speech. I, I want to ask Charlie that because they stopped doing that event three years ago. I I know I think um, is that date available for me to give the I said they stopped holding that event three years ago. Okay. We There's don't have no that event. event. Okay, well, maybe we'll start it again this year. I'm going, if I could speak on the end of July, and um, I'll speak about that event and how we need to not, we have because they are, uh, you understand the point is that that was a free speech forum. Oh, boy, now we don't see it. Now you got you're up there. Okay, the free speech. Do you understand what I'm saying, Charlie? About the can I speak at the end of July about free speech? That's my question. Is this a rebuttal to the topic tonight? I know it's a question because it gets to the essence of Well, I'm not the speaker. What are you asking me question? Ask the speaker question. I, I, no, Charlie, you're the you're the censor, you're the editor. The person that decides who can speak is essentially what is this about? I have no idea. Oh, what you're I haven't had a chance to speak about for four years. Yeah, can you see and everybody on the topic? Um, I hear it here about the plot. Do, do I have equal access to the platform to be able to speak about free speech? Can we have a, a right hand? Okay, I've got several hands that say I should be able to give the talk at the end of July on free speech. I'm asking you, Charlie, as the one that determines whether or not. I am get a hold of the meeting, will you? I'm getting a hold of the meeting. Uh, but that, what is she doing? You're not talking about the topic. Um, are you the chair? Uh, yeah, Charlie, but I'm right now trying to connect some. Uh, this is turning into kind of a mess. I'm going to have to reboot, guys. Okay. Charlie, I'm going to make you a temporary host. I'm going to have to reboot. I'm, I'm, all right. Charlie, i got to reboot. I'm sorry. Just give me a minute. They have a right to vote, too, right? Um, and the main thing is it's not a democracy. It's whether Charlie will let me or not. And that's called a, a dictatorship or a, what do you call it? All right, I'm gonna, Charlie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reboot, Charlie. I'm sorry. No, no, Charlie yeah. won't let me. I just want to speak at the College of Complexes. On that. He says there's two open days at the end of July. I'm asking to be able to give the talk at one of those days. Charlie won't give me an answer. Can can the, we have a group conscious, a social process?
Hello. No, I see your name up there. One eight four seven four four. Now you just went off, I think. I wound up uh, losing some some trouble. My apologies again. All right, Ellen, Ellen, we're moving on to the next rebutter. All right, uh, Charlie, you you said. Did you want to rebut Charlie? What? Hold on, I I got a rebut. You're on. I heard you. Okay. Yeah. I you want me to rebut? Yeah, go ahead. Your rebuttal is... All right, first of all, I'd like to thank... Tell us about the FBI, Charlie. Tell us about the FBI. Uh, let it, let's give Charlie the same... Let's give Charlie the same courtesy. Go ahead, Charlie. All right, first of all, I'd like to thank both our speakers for presenting this, and I'm going to cover five areas. Number one, the only rights you have our rights that are written into law passed by a legislature, a legislative assembly. That's why we have things called a Voters Right Act, Civil Rights Act. You have to have a law passed or written into the Constitution. You do not have made up rights, fictional rights from deities or ones you make up. That is the only rights you have. Number two, the reason a book is reviewed, as I used to do it, I get copies of books, and I only would re only review, I'm surprised you didn't understand this. Books are reviewed because they are recommended to be read. If nobody reviews a book, it has no recommendations. That's why you see on the blurb of books who reviewed it 
and what they said about it. Public librarians have their own review source, their own reviewers that their books that they recommend to buy. If a book is not reviewed by anyone, it's one of those 50,000 books that have problems or are goofy. Uh, books that are goofy are not reviewed. That doesn't now say something about bestsellers. I still remember as a paperback publisher, we put out a book called Sweet Savage Love. It was the number one selling paperback book. You think that's a good book? The one that's recommended? So using sales is no measure. But if it has no reviews, I don't think the book has any value. The next one is, uh, we, I've heard little or nothing, actually, amazingly enough, about the actual plot, which actually there's a contradiction here. First, you say, well, there's all sorts of things for voter suppression, no mail-in, no, and, and then you say, it doesn't matter how many votes he gets, he's going to receive. Oh, wait a minute. Why would they engage in voter suppression if it didn't matter? The idea is to get, I amazingly didn't hear it tonight, is to get the decision of who is president in the House of Representatives. Right. That is the final game plan of the plot, which we didn't hear tonight. Four. Um, I'm tired and I heard it again. The Green Party, third party, should not ever do anything because they are spoilers. We heard that before the Green Party was put together as a nationwide organization. I was involved in that. The fact of the matter is, if people do not vote Green, they perhaps might not vote at all. That's what you don't understand. I think the, the spoiler thing is, we were told that for years. Oh, we'll hold off on putting together a party. We It's too important, the upcoming election. Please wait. Please wait. We got tired of waiting. And we're going to run our candidates. If they're good or bad, let it be. You can be your choice. But don't tell us that we're doing something wrong by running a candidate, engaging in civic civic duties, civic actions, what we think best. There's nothing the far is about running a candidate for office and working towards an election. Nothing wrong with that. That's there's part of the strategy of winning elections is that you have opponents, all different kinds. Last of all, I heard something here tonight that is singularly amazing. Oh, please, all you have to do is vote. Okay. Well, if you think that's the beginning and the end all of, of the participation of good citizenship, you you don't know what you're talking about. You could work for a campaign like that guy's collecting signatures. You can contribute to a campaign. All kinds of different things, like I do. I post things on social media for the Greens. I compose them to all kinds of things. I register for each campaign that I like, read their emails, pass them on. All kinds of things go door to door. Anything and everything. But if you think all you have to do is vote and you're done, then I think you're you're really your level you're at a level one of a citizen maybe a two because a lot of people don't vote at all but you're not really doing very much and I don't think you're that great a citizen as you may claim to be all right that's it thank you looking forward to the thing where we're going to hear about project 2025 uh, at the end of the month. All right, uh, who else has a rebuttal now? We still got some time left. Uh, come on up, Ernie. No, Ernie, come on up. You got five minutes or so and speak away, okay? We'd love to hear you speak. Yeah, I'm not going to be particularly structured tonight. Enjoy the presentations. I would like Tim. Are your uh, are your uh, slides going to be available? Yes, I'll have them up on. I'll I'll make right. it available to Charlie. Yeah, Tim had some some good organized slides there. Um, 
I guess I guess I think I'm concerned about the election that's coming up. I don't believe, as as uh, Andy does, that the world is going to end with uh, if if Donald Trump was reelected. I think there's a serious danger he will be, but I think it'll it'll you know it'll be a, a tough four years, and I don't think it'll be a great four years if Biden is reelected. So I think we're just we're just into a little bit of a uh, I'm not going to call it a dark age, but I'm going to call it a little bit of a, you know, a very uh, non-progressive era in any direction. If uh, well, if he, any either one of these guys is elected, and that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, I've actually, over the years, over the years. I've, I've become a little soured on democracy, certainly as we run it now. The way we run it is not very good, and we could improve it with certain things like ranked choice voting, possibly term limits, possibly getting money out of elections, and uh, having shorter campaigns, and some of the other things that other countries do that make their uh, democracies work better. Uh, a parliamentary system, I think, would be better. But in any case, I'm not sure that a pure democracy is the best answer anyway. Somebody here said something about a benevolent dictator. I don't, was that you, Russ? I don't know. Yeah, Russ said that. Uh, and talked about Napoleon. Well, I don't know if we necessarily need a Napoleon because he did nothing but cause a lot of problems as well. But uh, there's a couple problems with a benevolent dictator. There's a few. First is finding one. Second of all, getting them installed, uh, and and the, the biggest one is keeping them benevolent. How do how do you get rid of the benevolent benevolent dictator when they when they become non uh, benevolent? So uh, there's a, there's a lot of discussion here that can go on, and I, I just every year something happens to take uh, a little bit more of my faith in democracy as we implement it uh, away. Uh, natural law, Charlie said there's no such thing as natural laws. Well, of course there are natural laws. Uh, the most basic one is gravity, but I'm, I'm not even talking about physical natural laws. I'm talking about the natural laws of the behavior of people as individuals and groups. And uh, Charlie says the only laws that, that govern us are those that are, I, I don't remember exact words, Charlie, but instituted in the form of laws and ordinances and so forth. That's not true at all. Most of the laws which we observe on a daily and hourly basis are, uh, don't really fit into that category. They fit into the category of, of good human behavior and or bad human behavior, but those, uh, those are natural laws. Uh, the most basic human natural law is the, the, the right of self-preservation and the right to protect yourself and, and the people that you care about, uh, regardless of what the uh, current uh, statutes might be that you're li living under. Uh, anyway, can so I answer that? that? And I answer that, Ernie. One yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think I have a couple minutes. Go ahead. The Libertarian Party has maintained that they followed natural law and not the legislative law. That's where it comes Ooh, from. I'm sorry. And who, the who other said that? That's what they. I've heard. I've gotten hundred emails on that, oh. and they said we follow natural law. They say there's something called natural law. And therefore, they can disobey and disregard legislative law. Well, as a as a matter of fact, people have been, have commented on disobeying legislative law. Martin Luther King is one of the most prominent people who once said, uh, I, I I don't remember the exact quote, but he said, "Well, there are two kinds of laws: the, the good laws, and we we obey those laws, and the bad laws, and we don't obey those laws." So, as a matter of fact, as a practical matter, uh, for years, uh, and of course, the American Revolution was was an, uh, a very big example of disobeying uh, the, the laws in effect at that time, which were imposed by the British Crown, and the French Revolution, and the Russian Revolution, and the uh, the uh, uh, female suffrage movement. These were all uh, cases where people ignored. The, uh, the legislated laws 
and obeyed the natural laws uh, that they thought were more important. I think I'm done for now, if there's somebody else. Who else Thank wants you. to go? Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Russell, yeah, good. You got five minutes, five Russell. Minutes. Five minutes. With references. Uh, he'll... All right, Russell. First thing to remember is we are not a democracy. We are a republic. What's the difference? First, uh, you have representatives. In a democracy, you would have to have a referendum on every law. And people would have to go to the ballot box to vote on it each time. Are they representatives? How do you know their rep our representatives are representatives? And second off, when you look at Trump and you look at Biden, you can uh, argue that they're, they're both bad. We are doing very poorly at, at coming up with someone suitable for president. And to attack Trump and avoid Biden, or genocide Joe, you're getting nowhere. Yeah. Why not a democratic republic? I prefer Jefferson just a republic. Jefferson was a democratic uh, Alan, republic. Let him finish his rebuttal, Alan, please. Well, when it comes to Jefferson, I would have gone for Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. And he came from Rothschild. He was a Rothschild agent. The Bank of England. And Ellen, can we let him finish? His well, you need banks. No, no. Well, they should no. they should show who they are, right? You can't have them secretly with covert operations controlling us. They're not covert. They're right out in the open. Hamilton wasn't openly representing Rothschild and the banks. And Jefferson was opposed to it. Cannot be, Ellen. Right? And as was Jackson. Ellen, Ellen let The him banks let... are the problem. They shouldn't be controlling okay, Ellen... democracy. Ellen, we and then the banks were also controlled by the Rockefellers. Yeah, and that's not good, is it? You like you think that's good? Well, they're all good. and J.P. Morgan. I know they're bad. That's no, they were good. <laughs> you need a financial industry. Now, they, it's, a, they're, they're, it's a dictatorship, an invisible king. They're, it's a feudalism. Then. They're controlling nice. everything. If the, the bank is secretly controlling who gets to run what the laws are, uh, Alan, that's not Alan, 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 can we at least... Uh, I'm just let, trying to help him make his argument. Uh, <laughs> let, him, let him finish. Well, <laughs> until we figure out how to select better people for president, we're always going to have this problem. Okay, okay. so what's the solution? Vote for better people. You had a problem. Ellen, Ellen. They were on the ballot. Who's but better? People didn't vote for them. Who, who is better? Who, who's better? Well, I got to say who's better when it comes to Trump or Biden. I, I'll stand with Trump. He would? Well, I personally wanted Ron DeSantis. So it's always Republican. Anyone is not a Republican Well, I like uh, Joe Manchin for Democrat. What's your source? Who, what do you read? What newspapers? Don't shut up. Yeah. yeah. The Northwest Herald. <laughs> what is that? So the newspaper in McHenry County. And they, they have endorsed candidates? I don't know, but it's a good newspaper. A yeah, it's the, uh, the Shaw Media Group. Yes. Okay. I'll say a few words. Do you have to want to go ahead, Sid? Sid, you want to uh, right. talk about democracy? Hang, hang on, Sid. I think Lincoln gave the best definition of democracy of, by, and for the people. We've never had that in the United States. We've had of, by, and for capitalism. Good. That's all we have. And it's always been like that. You have to look at the underlying structure of a society 
to see what's really happened. Capitalism is nothing but a hidden form of slavery. For instance, you work eight hours a day. Maybe two or one hour is the money you're getting for your work. The other six or seven hours, you're working for the capitalists. So it's a form of slavery, but you're working for nothing for six or seven hours. And that's what capitalism is. How could one person make so much money like a Ford, a Rockefeller, or any capitalist, unless he's stealing from the people that work. The people that work is the only ones that are creating value. Value is what you have when you sell something, effort is put into it, and that's what makes it valuable. They take raw material and they make something from it. And that work doesn't go to the worker. It goes to the capitalists. How else could somebody have a trillion dollars, one person? He didn't work for it. Somebody else worked for it. And he stole the money because we have a system called capitalism there is nothing but a form of slavery. Okay. Anybody else have a rebuttal? I think you're right. Uh, let's get ready for wrapping things up. It's about seven thirty-four. I'm gonna I'm gonna do for I'm, I'm gonna go first. I apologize for all the trouble with the technology tonight. We're working on getting that fixed. Uh, second of all, um, I'm just going to say thank you for everybody coming tonight. I know it's uh, kind of a little bit crazy, but I hope everybody at least will consider not voting for Trump because of his character. Andy, let's do good. You take the last word and adjourn us then, please. Yes, you do. Go right ahead, Andy. Yeah, we got minutes. Oh, Andy's gonna take the time up. Adjourn us, Andy, when you're done. Yeah. Yeah, might, might be five minutes, five or six. <clears throat> As you probably noticed, uh, I'm wearing my Vietnam veterans hat today because uh, we're coming up on Memorial Day. Also, when I travel on uh, holiday weekends, I always wear my hat so that the police stop me. They, they, they tend to give me a break because I'm a veteran. <laughs> so I wore my hat over to the Holocaust Museum in Skokie. I, I didn't have to pay the $9. The lady said, uh, just go on and thank you for your service. So <clears throat> there's uh, several places that Culver's, Culver's gives veterans 10% uh, off on their suppers for dinners. Could somebody turn the camera? Well, we don't see you, Andy. Oh, it's still on. Sis. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Back on camera. <clears throat> okay. Uh, one of my hobbies is uh, I work with. Uh, I'm a volunteer science Olympiad coach for seventh graders. <clears throat> and uh, we working with kids that age when they want to learn is a lot of fun. And we, the universal advice I have when we're working on the robotic problems and everything, if you're having a problem with something, you first have to correctly identify the problem, why it isn't working. And that, that just goes, you know, as soon as people are old enough to learn how to problem solve, if something isn't working, you have to correctly identify the problem. And then you have to correctly identify the solution. And <clears throat> Jen Senko wrote a brilliant book called The Brainwashing of My Dad. It's about, <clears throat> the, uh, she's been on the radio. This book is uh, a bestseller. 
Uh, it's a documentary also available on DVD. If you want to read a whole book, you can probably check it out from the library. It's called The Brainwashing of My Dad. She talks about what happened to her dad as he retired and sat around on the couch watching Fox News. He became kind of nasty and nobody wanted to be around him. So after a few months, uh, Jen and uh, the mom, <clears throat> they conspired to fix the remote when dad wasn't looking. So he couldn't tune into Fox News anymore. So he just went to the other channels. And he came after a couple, three months, his personality came back to the kind, loving person he used to be. Fox News is the leading uh, promoting promoter of hate and disinformation in this country. And they're brilliant at it. And there's been a bunch of other books written <clears throat> about uh, manufacturing consent. That's it stems from uh, Hitler, uh, that's Hitler's playbook. You promote a big lie over and over and over. The, the more you tell it, if people are inundated with a lie 24 seven, a fire hose of propaganda, a fire hose 24 seven, after a while, <clears throat> they first learn the ability to discern, to discern what's real and what isn't. And then after you lose that ability, you lose the ability to think critically. So, um, yeah. there are books. God damn it. One of the best books I never heard of General Smedley Butler, the most famous Marine general in history that retired in 1935. He wrote this book called War is a Racket. He said, Al Capone operated in three districts. Me and my Marine, Marine boys, we, were, we operated on three continents. We kept the third world safe for, we were, we were muscle, high priced muscle for the mob. Standard Oil, American Fruit Company, or United Fruit, the big corporations that wanted to pillage resources from other companies, the Marines went in and cleared the way. Butler's book was the first one I ever saw <clears throat> that spells out the difference between profits for corporations, like they sell clothes or shoes, boots, uh, all kinds of materials to the military in peacetime. He said, you might make five or 10% on a pair of boots, but as soon as you go over into wartime, you can make 100%, 200%, 500% on the same materials. Some, some types of steel that is used to make bullets and other things for wartime, that steel, uh, you know, you can make $10 a ton profit, which is a decent profit, 10, 12%, 10, you know, 10 or 12% profit in peacetime. But in wartime, one day later, when you start prepping for war, the corporation, you make 500,000, 1,500% profit on that same ton. So war is immensely profitable for the corporations. And every if we if we're at peacetime too long, <clears throat> it's like the shelves get full after Christmas time. If people don't buy stuff, you have to have an after Christmas sale where Kmart dumps the shelves and to get the new springtime stuff coming in. So I realized after I got out, the Vietnam War was like an after Christmas sale. You gotta dump that stuff on some country to start getting orders coming in. You can't just let your shelves get full of bombs, bullets and everything where you're at peacetime. Then the corporations begin to lose money because their stock prices and their profits are propped up by war profits. War is immensely profitable. Buckminster Fuller wrote a book called Critical Path in 1984. And he said, we have two industries in America and the American people are going to have to choose which industry is going to become dominant because one of them will. He said, we have a living industry that produces everything for people to live better, refrigerators, clothes, cars, and everything else. And then we have a killing industry that produces bombs, missiles, planes, helicopters, tanks, everything you need to go forth and kill a bunch of people everywhere for profit. And Eisenhower, Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex. He said, beware of that, and that's what we have today. The military-industrial complex with what we call billionaire predators 
they are running America. And to them, war is profitable. And so rich people that live in gated communities, they don't care that the country goes down the tube. They think that they're going to be able to survive in their gated communities. They don't know the sea level is coming up 50 or 60 feet in this century because they're, they're not paying attention. They think, well, we can just, we'll uh, build resorts on mountaintops somewhere high up. In, you know, so they're, they have the money, so they're not going to be affected by the rising sea levels from the destruction that's coming from climate change. But those three articles I gave you, one of them is about Donald Trump. Tom Harbin wrote a brilliant article two days ago about the characteristics of Donald Trump. And once you know who and what he is, no ethics, no morals, no conscience, the man can barely read and write. He paid people to do his term papers and everything else to help him get it through school, but he speaks. He's a brilliant, brilliant speaker using uh -huh. Hitler's playbook to uh, ramp, ramp, uh, ramp up crowds and, uh, you know, always never look the paper trail like a mob boss. He just hints at what he wants done. Phil Rockstraw wrote an uh, article called The Suit. It's on Smirking Chimp from, I think, October. But it's, it's published in several places. It's in the archives. It's called The Suit. The presidential suit. He says, what does it say about our country that we allowed a man to fill the president's suit, a person who was actually a bloated, bloviating, two-legged, toxic waste dump in the shape of an ugly human? That's who and what Donald Trump is. Can you imagine? I just ask you to imagine one thing. Imagine a, a, a spaceship landed on the White House lawn and says, take me to your leader. I want to talk to the leader of this planet and see if they're ready to enter the Federation. And you take them to Donald Trump. After a, an intelligent meeting with Trump, that spaceman would go back and say, um, we probably just better nuke this planet out of existence because these people are nasty, too ugly. Trump, you know, Trump is supposed to be a representative of our country. When you, you couldn't, you would be hard pressed to find a candidate more corrupt, more morally deficient. You know, I've, I've been bragging about Trump for seven years now. Trump is number one in two categories. Number one, out of all the categories you need, decency, honesty, ethics, uh, intelligence, enough to understand political things, the ability to read and write and un understand briefing. Trump has none of that, right? He's totally unqualified for the job. That, that would be okay if he was, it was a plumber. But Trump also is number one in the characteristics that should have had him chucked out of the office in the first 72 hours. Vindictive, long-time mobbed-up corporate criminal. The man's a lying sociopathic psychopath. No, no world leader can trust him. You know, no, even his own people around him can't trust him. And, and nobody wants to sit next to him in, in court. Uh, and, and but yet, look at what look at where we are today. We have a media system that's saying this man may be the next presidential candidate. That's what I'm talking about. Media blackouts. The media is running a coordinated blackout, basically on the basic fa facts of who and Trump, what Trump is, while they're simultaneously promoting him as the next president next presidential candidate, oh, it's a horse race, he might win, when he should have been chucked out by Congress people following their oath. They took an oath to defend America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Anybody that tries to overthrow the government is automatically disqualified from ever holding public office. It's right there in the Constitution and right there in the oath of office that senators and congressmen take. And don't even talk about the bribes that the Supreme Court judges are taking. That's a whole other ballgame. So that's where we are. <clears throat> and the hope, hope for the future lies, there's tremendous hope that millions and millions and millions of young people <clears throat> from the climate protesters in 6th, 7th, 8th grade on up to the college protesters on campuses that are protesting the genocide in Gaza those stories are talked about in the climate book. Uh, Greta Thunberg's book is loaded. It's called the climate book. It's loaded with examples of beneficial programs going all over the world. 
And um, there's another one, a little book called Common Sense for the 21st, Common Sense for the 21st Century. It's written by Roger Hallam. He was one of the founders of the group in England called Extinction Rebellion. They said, polite, polite protesting hasn't worked anymore. You know, there, there's a famous say, if you guys haven't seen the movie Alien, there's a, there's a shot in the movie Alien, 1986, where the Marines are on this foreign planet. They're, they have machine guns and everything else, and, and they're patrolling under the, the nuclear power plant that runs this whole complex. They're hunting for aliens, right? And, and the lieutenant says, uh, look where your troops are. You, you can't be firing in there, or you'll, you'll burst the, the cooling tower, the pipes, and we'll have a nuclear explosion in four hours. So the sergeant says, well, collect all ammo, collect all ammo, can't be firing in there. And they're, they're hunting for these ugly aliens. And one, 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 one uh, private speaks up and says, well, what are we supposed to use? Harsh language? <laughs> what are we supposed to use? Harsh language? Well, that's where millions of people around the world are. We're heading toward the French moment. About a couple hundred years ago, the French says, screw this, we're putting up guillotines. We're starting to cut heads off with people that are doing what our billionaire predators are doing now. Watch it. Let's see. So, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of good things going on, except that the media don't cover it. It's in books. It's on that, that one site I said called Want to Know Info and Common Dreams and Smirking Chimp, or the articles that I gave you on the handouts tonight, th those sites are loaded every day with brilliant writers that have credibility going back 20, 30 years, many of them long time, they're retired journalists now. So yeah, there's, any of you can call me for information if you want, uh, feel, feel free to give you any sources or uh, there's books you can check out from the libraries. So there's, you know, we, like, Bookman, like Fuller said, we have to support the living industry, the industry toward life, rather than the industry of megadeth. That's the choice we have in the next eight months, okay. seven months. Okay. Wrap us up, Andy. Adjourn. Okay. With that said, uh, we are going to adjourn the college tonight, and we will see you all next week. Thank you.